think this is on. Hello everybody, this is podcast number three. Today we're gonna to talk about all things military, private contracting companies, US military, facts, stats, debt, how reliant is Europe on US military, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so first things first, let's talk about the extent to which the US economy is reliant on contractors and kind of the significance that that has. So this is according to the Department of Defense. I'm going to read you a quote. DOD contract obligations and payroll spending in the 50 states and the District of Columbia totaled $559 billion, which is 2.3% of the country's gross domestic product. If the total spending were divided across every US resident, it would amount to $1,684 per US citizen. So I'm gonna put that in normal people terms. U.S. contracting companies, that profit off of war, and this is not from a like activist position, which, hell yeah, I love you activists. You are amazing people. You do a lot of great things. I'm coming about this from an academic perspective right now. Sometimes they're related, sometimes they're not. You guys get my overall point. So these U.S. military manufacturers are, they, they have factories in every single state. Now, the purpose of this is to ensure that if there is a theoretical politician, whether it be a congressman, woman, something in between there, a senator, etc., who opposes a war, that would affect a contracting company. Then that contracting company could withdraw resources or withdraw that factory from that state, which would hurt the constituents of that representative, thus hurting their representative in terms of popularity, in terms of electoral support, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, thus causing kind of a lot of internal turmoil and it affects that individual's career. So the system that is created is systematically set up in order to ensure that there is an incentivization, in order to ensure, once again, that these companies are able to prosper. Do we get it? Okay, I'm gonna go one step further into this. Now, this is according to the cost of war. It's from Brown University. Essentially, it's an organization that collects a bunch of facts and stats regarding the U.S. wars. Here's what they say, quote, of the 20 states with economies most dependent on military manufacturing, 14 experience poverty at similar or higher rates than the national average. Oopsie poopsie. What does that mean? Well, it means that the states that are most reliant are exceptionally reliant. Okay, that sounds kind of basic. You might be like, well, wh what the hell does that even mean? Long story short, there are some economies in some states that are completely dependent upon weapons manufacturing companies in order to ensure that they survive. Does that sound like there's any sort of longevity to that? No. What's scary about this is the fact that the US produces 40% of the world's weapons. So wow, what does all this mean? Let's, let's tie this all together. It seems like there's a bunch of random parts. Let me, let me throw it all together. Okay, so here's the thing. We produce 40% of the world's weapons and it almost as if we have to produce these weapons in order to keep our own economy afloat into bringing some people out of poverty. Republican, Democrat, regardless, let me ask you a question. Does this seem like it is sustainable? Let me put this. Do you think that this is an intelligent idea at all in any way, shape or form? You want it sustainable? Is it sustainable? It doesn't seem sustainable. Does this sound like something that's ethical? No, it, does, it doesn't sound ethical. Okay. Does it sound like something that should be changed? Maybe revolutionize our industries so we are less reliant on these weapons manufacturing companies because it pushes our soldiers closer into war so they have to fight and die in countries we probably can't point to in a map? Like, do you guys even know where Central African Republic is? And don't say Central Africa, okay? Can you point it out? And this is not a dig against you guys. It's not a dig against anybody. And specifically, what my point is, is that by funding these things, we are not only promoting war, but at the same time, we are pushing our soldiers closer into wars that they shouldn't have to die in. Why does somebody in Arkansas or Florida or California or whatever, Oregon, why do they have to die in a war that they probably shouldn't be in? Weapons manufacturing companies develop weapons for who? Who do they develop it for? Well, actually, I can tell you that aside from U.S. wars themselves or Ukraine, by example, they also develop wars for, say, Saudi Arabia, who's the second importer. I was thinking, like, what is the word? Importer of U.S. weapons. They are creating a literal genocide against Yemen. Hmm, that doesn't sound like something we should support. What other industries could we potentially get into? That is my overall point. We need to change this into an industry that is more sustainable and ethically principled. What could that possibly be? I have an idea. 
What if we find a new market that is sustainable, say for example, instead of looking backwards, say for example, looking at coal companies, what if we looked into green technology? And what if we just absolutely viscerally smash the whole world in green technology, which is a sustainable outcome? We get people full-time paychecks to learn how to do this, give them the skills to be able to develop this technology, which would not only provide a livelihood for them, if you're worried about pulling people up from the bootstraps, making sure that they are able to change their own lives, we have to make sure that they have a sustainable project to ensue. So for example, if we were to train people, give them the skills to be able to get into an industry that's sustainable, not only could they provide for their family, but also at the same time, they could also give that job to their kids. And then their kids have a job, and then their kids have a job, and also at the same time, they're not destroying the environment. Now, even for those climate skeptics out there, who don't believe that climate change is a thing or in any of this, in which I can go on a rant about that, believe it or not, climate change is a thing. And if we look at the carbon dioxide and everything else between the industrial revolution and now, we can see that, oh, look at that, we're actually affecting the climate in negative ways. Okay, cool. Guess what? Even if we weren't to take any of that into consideration, guess what? We still need an industry that is going to thrive in the future. What industry is going to thrive in the future? Green technology. Hmm. So perhaps there should be a politician who should support a bill to increase industries that are more sustainable than weapons manufacturing. Food for thought. Okay. Story number two, if this is the podcast. If you are not watching the podcast right now, this is probably going to be the intro to another video. How much does the war on terror cost? And what is the significance that this has in our life? Now, you might be wondering, why the hell should I care? It's probably somewhere in a trillion dollars. Well, this is important because we have to know eventually, oh, this was a bad idea. Maybe we shouldn't replicate it. Do we even have the money to give to Ukraine or some of these other countries? Should we ensue operations in approximately 85 different countries? Is it our responsibility to do this? If Flint, Michigan doesn't still have water, believe it or not, yeah, that's a thing. They still don't have water. There's a bunch of articles I want to throw out your guys' way. I'm going to try to put as many on the screen as I can, but to be honest with you, that's a lot of editing and I'm running out of time and I want to produce more content for you guys and focus less on the aesthetic stuff. I digress. We need that money. So what exactly have we spent so far? We've spent $14 trillion on the war on terror. Do you feel any safer? This was operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other areas, specifically like a shadow war in Africa. We were already involved in Ukraine, fun fact, uh, before anybody even said anything about it. And I'm not spilling any leaked secrets. So for those of you who are mad at me for saying that. That's a thing that's been said. It's like a big open secret here. Okay, so here's something that you guys probably haven't thought of, or maybe you have, in which case, I, I'm sorry if I made you feel like uh, I'm thinking that you're stupid. Unequivocally false. I think a lot of you guys are highly educated in this realm. My goal is to give you guys an update unless you haven't followed it in the last few months. The last figures I've seen in terms of interest interest paid because we have borrowed a lot of this money and we've borrowed it from countries like China, who's the number two. We've been paying off China where we were over a trillion dollars. Now we're around $800 billion. Most of the debts are towards our European allies, etc. For example, well, in Japan, Japan's number one, it goes China and then it's like Luxembourg, Norway, UK, etc, etc. Okay. The last stats that we have that I've been able to find, it was about $6.5 trillion we're going to have to pay in interest by about, let me see if I have the specific facts, it was about 2,050 off the top of my head. So that's bad. And I guarantee you it's a lot higher now. $6.5 trillion is gonna take us generations to pay off. Do we feel any safer for that? I don't think so. I don't think you feel safer. I don't think you feel better about the geopolitical situations. I don't think you feel any better about what's going on in Ukraine. I don't think you feel any better about what's going on in China. I don't think you feel any better about what just happened in Afghanistan. Taliban still took over. What is my point? People might be like, hey, you're pitter pattering around the, you know, around the, the bush like a virgin at a feminist meeting or something. What is my point? Guys, listen, there's a point in time where we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and think maybe we shouldn't be involved in all these different countries. Maybe we should reallocate all of those investments back into ourselves. Now, to give you really specific details, the last my, my little last point on this, 
When we're involved in 85 countries, a counter argument to this is that there's a lot of operations that are training individuals in counterterrorism. So it's like, we're not technically in there, but we're training. Do you want to know what happened in Afghanistan? We accidentally trained the Taliban a lot of times. Okay. Not to mention all the weapons we've left over. Do you think, do, do you think that any of those projects have been su successful? Here's a scary one. What data exists that proves the effectiveness of $14 trillion? It doesn't exist. I've spent years studying this and I'm not talking about a bro science type of thing. That's why I'm in Paris. I've been studying this for a moment and it's not a flex. I'm a nerd. I sit in libraries and I talk to the policymakers in the US and here and I learn about what's been done. There's no data on this. That's the most expensive project that's never been pursued or understood. I met with the White House officials and uh, from Bush and Obama, I've met generals and ambassadors and people in other countries, these NATO officials. Nobody knows the effectiveness of it. Most people just agree that it's not effective. And I'm gonna do a whole like little spiel on that. But look guys, at the end of the day, $14 trillion, $6.5 trillion in additional debt. It's going to be a lot higher after this. We don't feel any safer in Syria. Seems like there's still problems. Pakistan still problems. Afghanistan, Taliban took over. Iraq, there was ISIS that happened as a result of that. China is increasing. By the way, there's no military simulation where the U.S. has ever been able to beat China and Taiwan because we don't have logistical capabilities of this. And yet we're still spending money and yet our infrastructure is falling apart. Guys, please, for God's sake, if you support any of these wars, just remember, they have not worked out for us. They have not worked out for us. It has not gone well. So please, for God's sake, can we at least prioritize some of the American things, American interests, do things for us. I think we can all agree on that. I don't give a shit if everybody says that it's such a politically volatile state out there. We should all be focused on ourselves. This one's going to piss a lot of people off, but it's the truth. It's the hard truth. I had a full field of study on this. Sources, description box below. Does NATO benefit the U.S.? Now, this, I, I'm living around a bunch of European individuals, even though I'm in a place called the American House, technically. But uh, this is going to piss off a lot of people. By the way, if I keep looking off into the distance, it's because there's a, there's a goddamn yellow-eyed pigeon staring at me. I just nicknamed him Chernobyl, but he's always around here. Anyway, freaking me out. So if I look like slightly sketched out, that's why homeboy keeps staring at me. And uh, back, to the, back to the story though, NATO. Does it benefit the US? Okay, how many countries are in NATO? 30, there's 30 countries. And here's a screenshot I found that I thought was really interesting. This is according to NATO themselves. The US covers two thirds of total spending and there are caveats that I personally will get into regarding that. Sorry, I should have read more of a quote, but that's like the big idea. I just want to save you guys time. Now there's a guy named Hugo Mayer. I don't know if he wants a shout out or not, but there's a shout out for Hugo here. I'm not going to misquote him, so he's not going to care about this. Hugo is a grand strategist. He's one of the best in the world understanding foreign policy, specifically NATO foreign policy. And he had conducted interviews with individuals who are in charge of NATO foreign policy, including a lot of German defense officials. I will not name who they specifically were, but they had all unequivocally stated that without the US, NATO as it currently exists would not be able to exist. Europe does not have the resources for that. Now, even though a lot of people say, well, the US is a big economy, we are able to contribute more. Well, there's caveats inside of NATO itself where each individual country is supposed to give 2% of their GDP towards military costs. That has not been met by our, our being US military counterparts, our European allies. And that is where we're gonna get into all of the problems. So I'm gonna read you a quote. This is, by, this is by NATO itself. In 2021, eight allies met the guidelines of spending 2% of their GDP on defense. First of all, I'm gonna stop there. Just eight out of 30. Okay, what, the, like, what a disrespect, first of all. We're contributing a majority. I'm going to keep reading now. Up from just three allies in 2014. Oh, ooh, great. The United States account, accounted for 51% of allies' combined GDP and 69% of combined defense expenditure. A lot of people like to say, well, the U.S. has, we have military operations across the world that don't involve Europe, so we shouldn't expect the same thing from Europe. But at the same time, like I'd said, they're supposed to contribute 2% of the GDP. 
So here's what, here's what really bothers me about this whole situation. If the US military were to theoretically cut their budget, would we have enough to still be safe? Yes, yes we would. Did you know right now as, with stand, as it stands, the US has a bigger military budget than the next 15 countries, most of which are our allies? Also, this is also kind of a side tangent, but if we were to cut our military budget in half, we would still have a bigger military budget than China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia all combined. So that's what we're getting to the table. We're bringing this to the table. And the European allies just have to give 2%, 2% of their GDP. And they can't even manage to do that. A lot of which is just a lack of discipline and a lack of interest. They know that the US will stand by their side regardless. I find that is to be a little token of disrespect. For example, I think it's ridiculous that the fact that these European countries have these amazing healthcare systems and yet we can't get healthcare for Americans, we're busy going off and doing these types of operations. And now the funny part about this too is I've, I've brought the question to the supposed defense experts in Europe. I pissed a lot of people off. I raised my hand once and I said, hey, what is the benefit of NATO for the US? What is the benefit? I want to make sure I get this right. So when I asked them this, first, the concept of debt came up. I'm not going to name names. One of these supposed experts had said, well, NATO has a lot of economic benefits. And I said, what economic benefit is so great that it compensates for the US military budget that we provide, as well as the amount of aid that goes to Ukraine, even though we don't even live in this area. And they said, well, I mean, NATO holds a lot of debt for the US. And they're willing to do that because they're allies. My response was, where does the debt come from? Mostly war. Okay, so they're, they, Europe, they're enabling the US to spend more money on war for them by temporarily footing the bill until they profit from interest. So we're, we're providing a nuclear blanket for them. They're footing the bill and then they're going to profit from the interest. So how, again, how exactly does this benefit the US? Now, I, I love Europeans. Listen, Europeans, listen to me right now. I love you guys. You guys are great. But you also low-key hate us. You also take advantage of us. We shouldn't be leading. We do not make great decisions all the time. Look at Iraq. Congratulations to some of the countries for saying that we shouldn't be in Iraq. Congratulations. You don't want to be led by us. And we shouldn't have to lead you. That's the point. Okay, now here's another argument from the Institute for Geopolitics, Economy, and Security. So that's like the name of this supposed organization. Quote, citizens can hardly get informed about the facts of economic progress that a NATO membership brings, as well as overall prosperity, rising living conditions, excuse me, standards, building infrastructure, better health, and education. Who is this referring to? Has any of this been benefiting the US, by example? For example, if we, let's look at the infrastructure. They just said it benefits infrastructure. Our European allies have the top infrastructure in the world. The US has a C minus. Standards of living. A lot of European countries have increased their standards of living because they're, it attracts investors. US standards of living are decreasing. Some other people say, look, the investors are American. Benefits Americans. Haven't increased the standards of living. Might benefit a few American companies. That doesn't work its way down to the people. Perhaps a good idea is to have more redistribution, higher taxation like it used to be for these top 1% individuals. Maybe that's a better way to increase our standards of living than provide a nuclear umbrella. So if, for example, I don't know, I'm going to name a random country, Serbia, if Serbia gets invaded, then we have to get in a nuclear exchange with a different country like Russia, and then we have to sacrifice Houston, Miami, New York City, etc., Maybe that's not the best way to increase the standards of living for a supposed investors who are pocketing cash that we're not receiving ourselves as average Americans. Maybe we should just have better taxation. So again, how are we benefiting as Americans? A bunch of Europeans have told me, these, these supposed security experts, that the US is the world protector and it is our responsibility to ensure that people are protected from other countries like Russia. I say, who the f says that we have to be a protector? The US has tried to be a police force. Has it worked out? 
I don't think so. Does it benefit Americans? I don't really think so. So if you want to, if you want to protect her, then why don't you guys go protect yourselves? I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I also don't think we're very good at it right now. I don't think our American people want it. And you guys hate us. So if you guys want help, could we help you? Sure. Sure. As long as it works for us. And right now, what we have with NATO, I'm sorry, it doesn't work for us because you're not holding up your end of the bargain. And we have a shitty deal to be in with, and that's also partially our fault.